On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Tom Philpot. He is the food and ag correspondent for Mother Jones Magazine. Tom, uh, welcome to the program. Good to be here, Sam. Thanks for having me. So um, about a week ago, I guess it was, maybe it was earlier, uh, I, I, I've lost uh, complete track of time, but there was a, a piece in the New York Times um, talking about a Hawaiian uh, lawmaker, or I should say a council member, who was uh, trying to follow up on the implications of uh, GMOs. And um, it, it highlighted the, the, the notion that on the left, and, and, and perhaps in, in other uh, circles, there is a, a tremendous amount of skepticism of GMOs, um, some of which, or at least part of which, is unfounded in terms of the science. For, let's start with just, tell us what GMOs are. Okay, um, well, in traditional plant breeding, um, what, what people have been doing since the rise of agriculture 10,000 years ago is um, selecting certain, you know, cert, you know let's think about um, maybe apples. Um, you select certain apples that, that fall from the tree that, are, that have particular um, traits that you like, and you save those seeds and plant them again. Um, and through that sort of long and slow process, you develop um, varieties. Um, we did this, let's say, with tomatoes is probably a better example because it, they're not, they don't come from trees. Um, and um, and the, the technology stayed pretty static. There, there were um, the, 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 there were some innovations over the years to, to speed the process up. Um, but basically, if you were working with tomato plants, then you were staying in the tomato genome. You did not um, move genes across in different species. What, what GMOs allows um, plant breeders to do is um, take genes from other organisms um, that, that maybe are going to give the, the target organism a desired trait, um, a, a trait that wouldn't otherwise be there. And so you're splicing this, this gene into this, this, uh, this other genome and creating a new trait. And that's that, that's basically what it is, and um, and there's two things that go on there, or, or two ways to think about it. One is that it is um, is simply a continuation of traditional plant breeding with this new tool, and it's not really very very different at all. And that is the the industry's take on the one hand. On the other hand, though, they also and this is where the contradiction comes in. They also claim that by doing that. They're creating novel products that need patent protection, and if the um, if there's a novel product that needs patent protection, then something is going on that's different than before. So I think the industry has got a, a contradiction built into its, its position there. All right, yeah, and and I want to get to that aspect of it in 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 a bit. But essentially, we have this technology that um, uh, was started, I believe, in the '70s, uh, and this technology is, uh, as you say. Taking the, um, the 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 genes essentially from a from a, across species and um, right. and, and the one of the sort of I guess I mean there are and 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 this is where the the argument against GMOs or the skepticism of GMOs becomes nuanced. There are some who contend that. Eating the genetically modified uh, plants that have been modified on this um, uh, gene level across species is unhealthy. There's no science that supports that 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 thesis, is there? Right, and I think I think the thing the thing with with that is that um, I think people generally acknowledge that when when you do this process, you 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 do create novel proteins, and there's a potential for these novel proteins to act in a way that that is new and different and potentially harmful. And the scientists that uh, who I know that are that are not on the lunatic fringe, but that have um, a sort of a skepticism of the pro of, of of GMOs. What they say is that it's that it uh, it really has to be on a case by case 
basis that you can't say that all GMOs are unhealthy and are causing problems, but nor can you say that all GMOs de facto are safe and aren't going to, aren't going to cause problems. And you, you need to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. And right now, um, there is, you know, there, there aren't a lot of long-term multi-generational seeding studies that, that look at particular crops. And, you know, you would have to do, you know, every little, like, every, you know, every uh, variety of, let's say, Roundup Ready corn that comes out or um, because they have different, um, different genetic events that, that trigger them. And, and study that. And when when we have studied that, it's true that um, you know there's no obvious huge um, problem with any GMO that's on the market now. And so it's true that when you hear people say stuff like GMOs cause cancer, GMOs trigger allergies, there is uh, little or no evidence to, to back that up with existing GMOs on the market. Okay, so once we've established that, and I think we should also say that my understanding is that even when you do um, sort of a non-cross-species uh, um, uh, modification, there's still also the chance of those proteins, um, uh, of, of potentially toxic proteins, I guess, uh, to be developed in those organisms. Hey. That's, that's my understanding. But let's leave that aside. Yeah, that's probably true. And it's okay. So let's yeah. leave, but let's leave that aside because... The, the area in which, um, uh, you know, I think it becomes problematic is, is, is what you mentioned earlier, was that it has changed the nature of food uh, at, into a, a patentable commodity. And that's one aspect of the implications of this new technology, new, I guess, 40 years, um, in this argument. So, so uh, flesh that out for us. Uh, the idea that these uh, corporations now say, well, we're doing something substantially different enough so that we can basically own all of it. Right. And so they have, they have won through the political system and various court cases very strong patent rights. And you know, here, here's one nuance of the debate that doesn't get painted very often, and that is that the technology... Um, has been way overhyped in that it hasn't succeeded. So it's been, you know, you're right, the, um, the first sort of successes at it started in the 70s, and it didn't, it wasn't commercialized until the mid-90s when we start to get um, genetically modified corn and soy and cotton to the market in, let's say, 1995 or 1996, and then it um, grows very rapidly from there in those, in those commodities. But to you know, almost 20 years into commercialization, you know, 40 some odd years into the technology's existence, the industry has only uh, been able to put uh, on the market in a really big way two traits. It's only been able, able to achieve two major traits um, in a commercial way, and those are um, herbicide resistance. That's that's a big one. That's the biggest one, and that is where crops are engineered. Uh, Crops are engineered to withstand particular herbicides. And the other one is called um, BT, basically BT corn and cotton. And BT is a naturally occurring um, pesticide that um, has, you know, it's a naturally occurring bacterial pesticide that the scientists have isolated the toxic gene to, to bugs and spliced it into corn and cotton. So those, those plants express that toxic trait and, um, and kill insects. Um, and those are the only two traits that have come to market. And um, one big reason is that the technology is less precise than it's, um, than, than, than it's touted to be. And also because, you know, until the late 90s, until the, the mapping of the human genome, there was basically a one gene, one trait theory out there. When they mapped the human genome, they found far fewer genes in the human genome than they expected to, and the upshot of it is that genes interact in complex ways that are a little understood, and um, it's really hard to engineer a trait like, let's say, um, the way that a plant takes up water and making that process more efficient, with, with the way that a plant uses water, is a system that's been, that's evolved over millions of years, and it's very complex the way those genes interact, 
And there's one gene to pull out of, say, a cactus plant and stick it in corn and make corn uh, drought tolerant. And so the industry has not been able to achieve these complex traits. And so basically what we get on the, get on the market is more and more herbicide-resistant traits. And that, that's kind of where we are right now with it. And um, I think what, what the industry did was when they started to realize that what these companies like Monsanto – and Dow and DuPont started to do was they started to buy up seed companies. So they started to say the first business model was, okay, let's be like software companies and we will sell some seeds, mainly the, mainly the, the, the genome to other seed companies and they will license these traits from us. And when they realized that they weren't going to have all, a bunch of blockbuster um, seeds coming out, they said, let's just, let's just sew up the seed companies, uh, the, the seed business itself. And so what you start seeing starting in the early 2000s is Monsanto and DuPont and these companies buying up smaller seed companies, and now they dominate um, basically the global seed market, especially in, um, you know, the big commodity crops like corn and soybeans, but also increasingly in vegetables. And so what they're doing is they are – so we're, we're in a position now where these companies basically own the global seed market – and that's just, that in itself is something, I mean, this is market concentration at the extreme level over something that's very vital to our day-to-day -day existence. And it's something that we should be concerned about, I think. All right, let's, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll work our way more to the implications of that. But I want to go back because this is important because we were sold the notion of the value of GMOs. I mean, if we've established that uh, any type of like immediate health risks uh, from GMOs are, um, uh, at the very least, uh, substantiated by the science. We were also right. sold... Right, and, they're, and we, they're probably unlikely. Right, okay, so um, uh, stipulated. The benefits that we were told was that this stuff was going to feed populations, it was going to provide uh, extra nutrition, it was going to provide crops where no crops could uh, hither uh, to for exist, um, and uh, we're going to be able to, um, and, and I guess the third sort of like proposition was, we're going to be able to use less herbicides and pesticides right. uh, on these things. So um, reserve the third uh, of those sort of promises, but the, in terms of the first two, in terms of like golden rice, which was supposed to be far more nutritious and um, or the idea that we were going to have crops that, you know, could grow in barren lands. Those two promises simply have not occurred from this technology, have they? Right. And so the, the, the problem is often that when you achieve the desired trait, um, other other undesirable things happen with the plant. Like maybe, you know, you achieve something like um, um, increased uh, ability to withstand drought, um, but then suddenly the, the plant is susceptible to some, you know, commonly existing pathogen in the environment that the, the normal crop is, uh, is not susceptible to. So it's this constant, you know, fill, you know the, the finger in the dike uh, idea. Um, that these that these uh, breeders are up against, and yeah, for that reason, um, these promises. You know, we're still hearing about the genius of golden rice, and you know, the the, the basic narrative of it is that sort of left wing anti science zealots have have blocked it. But what you don't hear about is how it's still in development. Um, we've been hearing about golden rice since the 90s. That that kind of controversy erupted, you know, probably in the late 90s. And, you know, it still hasn't um, been, it still hasn't reached the level of commercialization. And it's for those reasons that I'm talking about, that when you increase the vitamin A content of it, that you're, you're doing other things to the plant that are undesirable. And, um, and it's also true of, uh, of drought tolerance. In 2000, in, I think it was 2012, Monsanto did release and get um, approval for a drought tolerant corn. So it's like this major news, uh, you know, big, big step forward for the industry. But the reason why you haven't heard about it and it hasn't made a splash is that that drought tolerant corn, uh, according to the USDA and its uh, approval of it, and it was citing Monsanto documents, didn't perform any better than existing 
um, drought-tolerant corns on the market that have been developed through conventional breeding. And it turns out conventional breeding, um, especially with new, uh, new technology um, but without going across genomes, is actually really effective, a lot, a lot more effective than it's given credit for, and a lot cheaper than GMO technology. And, you know, you can go to, you know, you can go to a place where corn has been grown for a long time in arid areas, and that seed stock becomes a, a great resource for developing drought tolerant corn. The corn genome itself has has those traits in it, and so yeah, you're right. Um, those promises have have not been met, and they're always dangling in the future. We're going to get this great golden rice. We're going to get um, you know nitrogen efficient corn and things like that, and it, it just hasn't happened yet. And we should and say I'm skeptical that it ever happens. And to be fair, though, um, the that uh, that that pre-existing drought tolerant corn that's just simply not as profitable i mean you can't you can't right yeah you can't you yeah, can't good. you can't quarter the market on that um yeah and, there, and there's, no, there's no technology fee built into it so you get when you when you have a gmo trait you you charge a, a technology fee for it and you get this really exclusive contract and um you don't get that with a non a non GMO trait. So let's go to that sort of that third uh, category of the um, herbicide resistant and 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 like you say, there's there's the herbicide resistant um, uh, corn, uh, let's say, uh, and then there's the uh, the BT corn or BT potatoes or BT soy, which uh, emits its own uh, insecticide and the there are it seems to me there are less issues in terms of the broader implications of our food supply and our environment with the bt products um than there are with this herbicide resistant uh corn because the herbicide resistant corn ends up having um ends up not doing what it's supposedly supposed to do which is to diminish the use of dangerous herbicides. That's right, um, but there is a problem with with the with the BT uh, corn uh, specifically, and, and also in, in some in some cases BT cotton. And that is that the it, the way that it's used is that you know you get um, you get these large swaths of land, you know, tens of millions of acres um, of land um, planted in the same variety of BT corn. Now there are, with BT corn, there are these refuge zones. So if you, um, because, you know, the, the idea is that there are certain insects that will develop resistance. Or there are certain insects, there's a, a, a bug called the Western corn borer that um, is, uh, speci- is very uh, attuned to, to growing resistance. And so, that when the USDA approved BT corn, it uh, it made farmers um, agree to plant a buffer um, where they where they plant non BT corn um, uh, close by to ensure that there's this refuge where there's corn borers that are growing that aren't developing resistance to BT. Um, and but there was a major controversy when it passed the USDA, and most scientists who looked at it thought the refuge should be much larger than it was. And Monsanto lobbied. And, and I, I don't have the numbers up in my hands, but they but they lobbied to um, to get this sort of tiny refuge built into the law. Um, and predictably enough, in the Midwest, you're getting resistant um, Western corn borers coming up. And scientists, I mean, I'm sorry, farmers are responding just like they do to the failure of Roundup Ready um, crops, and that is that they're spraying more and more pesticides. Um, and this is... Um, rippling to the Midwest, and uh, most people believe that, most people I've talked to, including soil scientists and insect scientists in the Midwest at land-grant universities, say that this problem is probably going to spin out of control, and you're going to get a situation analogous to what happened with herbicides. And so I think what you get, what, the main thing that GMOs have done in the United States since they've, been, they've come online is that they've intensified industrial agriculture. They've, they've allowed farmers to ramp up uh, monocrops to plant, you know, more and more of the same thing uh, because it's easier to manage insects if, you know, the, 
the plant itself is ex ex um, expressing an insecticide, and it's easy to manage weeds, at least for a while, if you can douse them with herbicides anytime you want. And so it's, it's allowed this ramping up and intensification of industrial agriculture. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, you know, I feel like we're on this, what ecologists call a pesticide treadmill uh, in the Midwest. And, you know, it's interesting, in the same period that BT corn took over the Midwest, um, and so you think, well, that, that must mean that, that um, less insecticides are going to be used. Um, at the same time, the practice of, of treating seeds with neonicotinoid pesticides uh, also um, exploded in the Midwest. So it's this extra pesticide that they literally treat the seed with, and the seed is planted, and the, the corn plant, and this is also in, in soybeans too, the, these plants not only express, like the corn plant not only expresses B, the BT toxin, but it also expresses this neonicotinoid. It gets into the pollen, into the nectar, into the leaves of the plant. And there's a lot of evidence that this practice, which is ubiquitous, is um, con uh, contributing to the declining health Colony of honeybees and the phenomenon, phenomenon of uh, uh, colony collapse disorder. Yeah, and so, so you know, know, even even the even the pesticide thing has not been the the boom that it's uh, cracked up to be. I mean, is there is there is there hard data that shows that in uh, or not as to whether or not actually the use of this? I mean, okay, so Roundup uh, can now be used, um, but we've got now um, uh, super weeds that are developing a resistance to Roundup, which then calls for the use of uh 4 d right? Is that what it is? Right. Um, That's what it's called, yeah. Tell us what 4 d is, because, I mean, this is, I mean, this is, this is the dynamic that is really problematic here, is that uh, we're playing whack-a-mole, and the idea was that we, we were going to get rid of the moles, but all that seems to be happening is we're actually getting more moles uh, and uh, yeah. of a more virulent uh, species of moles, as it were. I mean, to, to that's right. All right. So, yeah, tell us what that's right. So, two, two, four D is. Well, two, four D is a, is a, is a pretty bad herbicide. It's an herbicide that is associated with non -Hodg Hodgkin's lymphoma and other, and other cancers and was in the process, you know, basically one of the triumphs of Roundup Ready. Roundup, Roundup is a Monsanto herbicide that is uh, used ubiquitously on corn and soy. Um, Roundup Ready corn and soy was was uh, was was supposed to lead to the phasing out of older, harsher chemicals like 2,4-D, and in fact it did. Um, if you look at the the use rates, and I've got this in a, in a recent blog post, um, the use rates of 2,4-D declined sharply in the first 10 or 12 years of the reign of Roundup Ready. But then as we develop resistance to Roundup, um, you see. You see that that it there's a trough, and then 2,4-D uh, use um, comes back with a vengeance, and it's now higher than it was before um, Roundup Ready was rolled out in 1995 and 1996. And um, and so you're you're getting this um, this phenomenon of farmers are reverting to these older, more toxic um, herbicides. And the problem is that once you already once you have in place a bunch of weeds that are already resistant to Roundup. And you start dosing them with 2,4-D, you're, you're going to create weeds that are resistant to both herbicides, and that's that's happening now. And the um, industry's solution to this problem, as I wrote about, is to roll out um, crops that are resistant to both herbicides. And so farmers will not only be spraying 2,4-D uh, before this, you know, before the, the plant emerges, before the crop emerges in the spring, but they'll be they'll be spraying it all year round. And these, um, you know, weed scientists at Penn State put a study out saying that um, it's a, a virtual certainty that you'll, you're going to get 2,4-D and Roundup resistant crops, or uh, sorry, weeds, and an, you know another upward spike in herbicide use in the Midwest. And you know, it, 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 it's important to note that the same companies that sell these seeds and make billions of dollars in profit from it also sell the herbicides. Um, Dow is a major producer of 2,4-D. It's pushing this 2,4-D crop. Monsanto is a major 
produ- is the major producer, but not the only one anymore, but it's the major producer of Roundup, and it, sell, you know, it's, it owns the Roundup Ready Seed t- technology. And so these companies make money tw- two different ways, selling the herbicides and the seeds. And, you know, it's kind of jaw-dropping that they benefit from the failure of their products. Because when their products start to fail, uh, farmers still use them, but they just ramp up um, their, um, their herbicide use. And the reason why they still use them is market power. There, there isn't very much high-quality seeds. These companies have, have the seed, seed market sewn up, and there isn't very much high-quality seed that doesn't have these traits built in. So we have a, a sort of a giant self-licking ice cream cone where um, the, uh, the, these, these companies that now dominate the market and, be, and, and have squeezed out uh, more and more progressively squeezed out any alternatives uh, to their seeds. Uh, they just keep moving forward. Is there any, I mean, is there, is there any benefit, I mean, at this point? I mean, if we see this cycle continue, because we haven't even touched upon the implications of, okay, now, you know, it may be one thing that the corn can withstand being bathed in Roundup, uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and, uh, they're going to develop a corn that can be bathed in, uh, two, four D, but presumably this stuff goes somewhere. Right. And so we have the problem on one hand of, uh, creating a, uh, a, a monoculture. Um, we have the problem of, uh, less diversity in terms of the seed stock. We have a problem that they need to develop more and more and use more and more uh, pesticides and herbicides. Um, wh- where where do we see any offsetting benefit? And because we should make it clear, these are policy choices. To patent this stuff is a is a policy choice. Uh, to allow this uh, level of market dominance is a policy choice. Uh, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum. That's right. And there's one more policy choice that, um, that should be mentioned, and that is that the incentives in place from farm policy, and this is you know, basically the farm bill and we're talking um, crop subsidies and also subsidized insurance, these, these incentives offer – offer farmers, they just give farmers no incentive to do something different. Um, and so you could use policy to say that, okay, um, instead that we, that we will pay, that instead of paying you for how much corn you produce or um, ensuring that if you have a crop, that if you move into marginal lands that you shouldn't be growing on in the first place and you have a crop failure, you're going to get full compensation for it from subsidized insurance, so you might as well do it. That, 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 that's how it works right now. We took that money and said, okay, we're going to pay you um, based on the number of uh, crops you rotate into your system. So right now you're doing either corn and soy or just corn in some cases. There's a lot of corn on corn going on. Um, We're going to pay you to add a third crop, uh, like wheat or oats or something like that. And it turns out that just by doing that, just by adding a third crop to the rotation, um, you greatly disrupt both insect and weed patterns and you need less insecticides and herbicides. And also, you need less fertilizer. So it would have all these positive knock-on effects. Um, um, or we'll pay you to, to plant cover crops in the fall and um, roll them down in the spring and then, you, um, and then plant your crop into this sort of dead patch of the cover crop. And the cover crop blocks out weeds um, and, and so you get this, you know, basically herb, herbicide free system and we're going to pay you, and it's a risk. It's a new farming style. So we're going to pay you to do that, um, to take some, to put some of the risk on the public. And that would greatly reduce, um, herbicide use. Um, all these things could happen. There would be smart policies and they would work, but they would, uh, very much challenge the, the power of these, you know, these big companies that sell GMO seeds and herbicides. I mean, let's talk about it. It isn't like they're. All right, go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, continue that thought. It isn't like they're. Yeah, um, I, I, I think I was going to say it isn't. Um, it isn't like we don't have solutions to these problems. It isn't like we don't that we don't know how to reduce herbicides. We don't know how to get away from um, herbicide resistant super weeds. We we know how to do that, and it's pretty simple. But there's just no incentives in place to change. 
So, I mean, when we talk about uh, Monsanto, I mean, can the if this is the dynamic and this, you know, and frankly, this has been a bit of a debate on this program that I have had with some of our listeners. I mean, can we divorce the concept? I mean, obviously, in a very technical sense, we can. But in terms of the implications of, of public policy and the implications for our food supply and going forward, can we really divorce uh, GMOs as we know them now from the structure in which they exist and the incentive structure and the, the corporate dominance? I mean, you know, when we, when we talk about the, the issue of GMO labeling, um, you know, which would add at least some measure of transparency, if not to what you're eating uh, or uh, if, if not only to what you're eating, but more towards the how it actually gets on your plate uh, and, yeah. and how much involvement there is uh, in our own sort of uh, policy decisions that bring it there. Um, I mean, can we really divorce those two things? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think theoretically we could. I mean, I think we could um, we could revive and reinvest in public seed breeding, um, which you know I think has been um, an incredible, an incredible, incredibly um, useful public investment, um, you know, since the 19th century and more more 20th century, and the public public universities, public land grant universities, doing seed breeding. Um, for the the broad public to use uh, without patents, um, and we could we could re and that's, it still goes on, but it's it's been defunded and most most uh, seed breeding is now private. Um, we could reinvest in it, and there could be um, intellectual property structure. Like you know, we, we could do public GMO breeding that solves that looks to solve actual problems, and not move more pesticides um and there are you know there are i think at the margin there are things that, that gmos could probably help with um but um it would take a, a substantial investment because it's a very very expensive technology and it could quickly crowd out conventional breeding which is a lot cheaper and in for a lot of things a lot of basic things a lot more Cost effective and, and and cheap, but we but we could do that. We could say, okay, for certain projects like there's this problem of citrus greening happening in in citrus groves um, all throughout the world, but um, also in Florida and Texas and California where, where we have citrus. Um, it's this um, this pathogen that's attacking citrus plants, and um, it could wipe out the entire industry. And it looks like, and I dug into this, it looks like the most promising solution to it is GM and right now the industry itself the citrus industry is you know kind of uh, making the investment and exploring it and it's still years away and it's, it's difficult and hard and it's no silver bullet um, but for stuff like that for things that um, probably you know these these uh, these problems that emerge that really look uh, insoluble sometimes there is a GMO solution um, and so, yeah, I mean, we, we, we could have it on the table like that. It's just not how it, not how it works right now. So uh, from your perspective, uh, if, uh, if I was to put you in charge of uh, having one major policy shift that would begin to sort of uh, uh, alleviate the problems that are occurring uh, because of the way that we have commodified these seeds, uh, what what would it be? Would it be the patents, uh, some type of patent reform? Would it be uh, that uh, that seed bank that you just mentioned? What 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 would it be? Well, all of those would be tempting, especially the patent reform. But I think what I would probably do would be to re rejigger farm policy to you know base the basic idea being green payments for farmers, pay farmers to do things that we have research showing are effective and that work and that create a robust, diverse food supply with, without a lot of inputs and incentivize those things, make those things. And, you know, because uh, people complain about farm subsidies, but farming is an incredibly risky venture. Um, and especially now, uh, farmers are so highly capitalized 
and uh, they're, they're under huge debt, and it's hard to get get them to switch practices. And I, I think society needs to share some of that risk. But so I think paying farmers to do things to do things like plant cover crops and um, broaden their um, their crop rotations would be um, incredibly effective and just sort of make Monsanto irrelevant. Well, of course, we all know that uh, that would be the uh, first step towards uh, totalitarianism and would ruin all of our freedom. So uh, that's right. Uh, but um, Tom Philippot, uh, thank you so much for uh, talking to us uh, about this today. Um, it's 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 fascinating stuff, and it it's becoming. It seems to me it's becoming a, a, a the urgency of this problem is becoming greater and greater. So I appreciate your uh, your talking with us to it uh, to us about it today.